thanks for everyone for signing in this evening. Um, yeah, I'm in Croatia. I've been here for the last uh, two months. I'm actually out here working as dive safety officer on, on a commercial wreck diving project, but um, I've been able to follow my passion out here as well and got some cab dives in while I was here, which was pretty nice. Um, my beginnings, I, I started off as a dry caver. Um, I only learned to dive because I wanted to take my caving further. When I first started dry caving, um, it was very, very basic. It was a small headlamp from a walking shop, old clothes and some old boots. And me and my friends would go and basically follow these holes in the ground, um, found a guidebook, and eventually we started to get to obstacles. So firstly, you come to a drop, a hole, um, and we couldn't go down it. So we learned how to use rope to abseil. We learned how to use rope to climb back up. Um, wire ladders and other techniques like that. And then continuing, you eventually find water. And the reason for this is that caves are formed by rainwater, which is slightly acidic, dissolving away the rock and basically leaving tunnels. And the ultimate dream of a cave explorer is to enter the mountain at the top where the water goes in and follow the river's journey, subterranean, all the way until it comes back out at the bottom of the mountain. So a through the mountain journey of exploration. What appealed to me almost immediately with caving and cave diving was that in the modern world we live in, the grand Victorian age of exploration of Shackleton, Amundsen and Scott um, is long gone. We can fly over pretty much any terrain with a plane or with a satellite and photograph it in great detail. We can send um, surrogate rovers, um, ROVs, AUVs into the deep ocean. They don't need to be manned. The beauty of cave exploration is at this time, if you want to see where the caves go, you have to go there. You have to turn that corner, shine light on a piece of the planet that no human being, no surrogate, no technology has ever seen before. So you're treading new ground like an Earth explorer, which to me is fascinating. Another thing that really drives me with caving and cave diving is the variety. So on this first slide, we've got some really extreme examples, not only of types of caving and cave diving, but also of location. Um, it's been a great opportunity for me to actually travel the world. These photos, top left is the UK. This is one of my pet projects early on, we'll talk about later in the um, talk, a um, thing called Swildon's Hole. This is the cave on top of the Mendip Hills where the rainwater enters the mountain and later comes out in the famous Wookiee Hole that we'll also talk about more later. You can see here it's small, it's tight, it's muddy, um, it's very basic caving. To the right of that is the other end of the scale, closed circuit rebreather, dual bailout cylinders carried, multiple other bailout cylinders staged along the route during the swim into the cave. Um, and this is in Florida, in a place called Hole in the Wall, um, up in the, the north of the Florida cave region near to Jackson Blue. Beautiful, beautiful cave, very different technology to crawling through the mud as on the left. And then as to travel, the photo on the bottom left is in Siberia um, in the summer. Now there's pluses and minuses to going to Siberia in the summer. Again, we'll cover Siberia a little bit later, but one of the biggest minuses is insects. And then on the right there at the bottom is in the mountains of the Picos de Europa in northern Spain. And those tiny dots in that black hole in the middle of the picture a people to give you a sense of scale. So continuing that travel theme, some of the most beautiful places I've been have been traveling through the regions that lead to the entrances to caves. Um, the top left there is again the Picos de Europa in northern Spain, absolutely beautiful place, um, real remote wilderness, very, very wild place that there are very few roads going through in Central Europe, one of the last remaining true wildernesses. All of these mountains are limestone. Limestone is the rock that can be dissolved by rainwater. So these mountains are hollow. There's basically tunnels and rivers and journeys to be had through them. Now exploration tends to take two forms. Some teams will use dry caving and inevitably vertical caving with rope to travel down through the mountain following the river in riverways, waterfalls, etc. And then some teams will start cave diving in the valleys, in resurgences or springs. 
And eventually, if, if lucky, and if the geology and the region allows, those two points can be connected, sometimes covering tens of kilometers over that distance. And one such project I was lucky enough to be involved with was in Mexico. The guy on the bottom right there is Bill Stone. Bill has been a cave explorer for over 40 years, um, the inventor of the original cislunar rebreather system from the Mark I through to the Mark V that became the electronics for the Poseidon um, six and seven rebreathers that are available these days. And mainly the equipment he built, the Cislunas and then into the Poseidons, was built purely for his projects. He wanted to explore deep caves in southern Mexico, starting high in the mountains and working all the way down to the resurgence. And again, there's no hotels normally. When you get to these places, it's camp. Um, we've got top right there, a bush camp in the jungle of southern Mexico. Um, bivouacs created over the cooking area the sleeping areas, tents for people to sleep in, inside the secondary forest up on the mountain. And then bottom left there, we've got uh, a river valley that in flood season would be a river, um, but in summer season, peak summer, is a meadow. And this is on a place called the White River in the Ural Mountains. This is about four days travel into the expedition, following this river, down this valley, diving unknown sources, unknown sites as we go to try and find new cave and that is always the drive and the goal <clears throat> the journey can be long and quite varied so these shots are all from one of our russian expeditions again to the ural mountains in an area around the katerinburg chelabinsk um, we start off the easy way so we're four by four so there's a big uh, mitsubishi l200 and a land rover defender there all heavily fitted out with big off-road tires and other modifications Firstly, we drive as far as we can. Once you get to the end of the road or the end of the track or the end of the track you're trying to make, then we use other means. And on the summer trips here, we use two small Zodiacs. Now, the river initially was too small or shallow to actually follow with these boats properly. So all we did was walk along the river, pulling them by hand. When the river was really shallow, unloaded them, carried everything till the water was deeper again, reloaded and continued. The dual sausages in the uh, picture on the lower left, I think the pointer works here, these things here, they literally are tow behind sausages for fun in the rivers. Um, but what we did was put two of them together and built a frame on top of it. So compressors, generators and other gear we needed was loaded on top of that. This was a summer trip. We've been to the same place also in the winter. Different difficulties, different hazards. The winter, we used snowmobiles to travel down this river, but the temperature was significantly different. The lowest that we had on our expedition was minus 40. And then sometimes you don't even have four by fours, you have donkeys. So in Mexico, we basically were exploring just north of the Guatemala border, near to a town called Oaxaca, up in the mountains, in a cave called J2. The local ranchers would rent us their donkeys um, per donkey per load, First, to carry all the gear up the top of the mountain. Sometimes cave diving can be annoying. You have to carry all the gear to the top of the mountain. You then have to lower it all into the cave entrance and then descend down through the cave on ropes, effectively back to the bottom of the mountain, but now inside it to be able to get to your dive site. So the donkey takes it up and then the human donkey takes it down and back out again, and the donkey takes it back down. So it's a, a pretty varied, interesting, route to get to where you want to cave dive. And this is one example of a type of cave diving. This particular type of cave diving um, was formed dry. So the water dripping through the mountain dissolved the rock, creating um, tunnels, just like in a normal cave. Once the tunnel was created, the water dropped down to lower levels and basically it became dry tunnel. And then what happened is further rains <coughs> would fall on the mountain, work their way through the upper rock and drip from the ceiling of the tunnels to the floor. And any minerals that were in that rock that weren't dissolvable were then left behind to form these incredible speleotherms. Speleotherm is like the collective term. So if we have them hanging from the ceiling, they're stalactites. If they're growing up from the floor, they're stalagmites. If they join, they're columns. The super thin ones you see just in front of my 
pan there in the picture, this is a very young me in Mallorca, are straws, because they're literally like drinking straws. And this photo is pretty unique because the floor you see um, beneath the diver floating there is super delicate. It's the thickness of thick paper. And it, what it is, is once upon a time, there was a lake in this cave and the drips left little cornflake sized pieces of calcite floating on the lake. And then when the lake disappeared, the calcite floor was left behind. So this is a false floor. To lay a guideline in this cave, to be able to cave dive here, the straight distance from point A to point B would be 100 meters, but maybe 150 meters of line is needed to get between all these formations without breaking them. Very delicate, beautiful environment. When we went to Mallorca, this was my first expedition. I was a member of the British Cave Diving Group. I've become a qualified diver member. And uh, <clears throat> a team was put together by CDG Welsh section um, to explore what was known as Hidden River in the northern mountainous area of the island of Mallorca. But also while we were there, we were able to explore some sea caves around the southern area as well, some of which had been dived before, some we were able to extend, and others we were able to take some samples for life and other such um, hydrogeological science. The mountain area, our main aim, the Hidden River, um, Mallorca you always think of as English breakfasts and a pint of lager on the beach, and the southern coastline can be a little bit like that, but the north corner of the island up in the west is absolutely beautiful. Stunning mountain terrain, real cast mountainous limestone. Um, above the small town of Soya, um, there's an exiting river. But the exiting river comes from a really small hole. There's no obvious way to get through. Nearby, there's a dry cave that locals tried to convert into a show cave. So there's some concrete paths, there's no lights. It never actually opened up. But at the back of it, there's a flooded section. And we dive through that, which is static, very low visibility, um, normally on the exit. The photo on the left there is in this static sump, so it's sort of brown, muddy water. Um, this is on the way in, where there's a bit of viz. On the way out, it's generally very stirred up. But after this section, there's more dry cave. Um, it's really quite revolting. It's crawling in deep orange mud, carrying your stage cylinders and your dive cylinders and everything with you. And then suddenly you hear this roar of water and the nasty crawling muddy section stops on a balcony overlooking this beautiful crystal clear pool of water that my uh, colleague Steve Thomas is floating in in the lower photo. <clears throat> now that uh, photo, the light behind him is sat on a ledge at about nine meters. And then underneath that, that is a vertical shaft going straight down to 50 meters. The water is welling up out of it and comes through a restriction at the bottom. Our objective was not this side, it was where this water goes to. The downstream exiting water had been dived down again a shaft to 50 meters. The previous diver had tied off his line at that point, and our aim was to go and tie on and explore. And it was my first opportunity as a young cave diver to be the one who got to tie my line to the end of that previous line and head off into the unknown. We were able to get that line to the deepest point, it was around about 55, 56 meters, what we call the elbow, the bottom of the deep point, around the other side, fold up through some decompression on the other side to surface in a new section of dry cave, which led on to a new smaller sump that was too small to pass. So not a great massive amount of cave, probably something like 200 meters um, of distance, um, but passing a sump the new dry cave within the mountain, for me, a very special moment, my first chance to actually explore and say that I'd been lucky enough to be to a piece of the planet that no human being had seen before. <clears throat> As we said, on the southern part of the island, you've got these more traditional um, speleothermal filled caves. Now, this is a cave called Pastal Ganerva. It's closed now for protection. So uh, you can't go visit it and dive it. There are sites on the island you can still dive that are similar to this, like Seglada. But you can see this is very similar to the popular Mexico cave diving of the Yucatan Peninsula area. Things like car wash, cenote, and the other cenotes there. Absolutely beautiful formations. Now, remember we said these are only formed in a dry cave. So you might think, well, why is it full of water? What happens is the cave was once up in the mountains, the dripping water formed the tunnel, continued dripping water once the tunnel was dry, formed the formations. And then as mountains and rock 
platforms shifted and sea levels rose over the millennium, um, this fills up again with seawater. So this is actually salt water at this point in this dive. Further back into the system, which is quite common with these sea invaded caves, you then have a lens of fresh water on top from rainwater on the island. And sometimes you pass through that and you're then into fresh water cave further back when you're starting to go up into the mountain again. And this line between the salt and fresh water, a halocline, is like a false surface. You look up and you see this beautiful shiny silver mirror above you, which is what you normally see when there's a surface there. When you go to come up through it, you're not in air, you're in crystal clear water above. But as you pass through it, you blend the salt and fresh water and you get this bathroom glass effect. It's hard to see, it's wobbly to see. So really quite amazing, quite magical. Good for, for some photo tricks. From there, my next big um, expedition that I was invited on <coughs> was with my good friend and my regular cave diving buddy at the time, Gavin Newman. He'd been working with some of the dry caving clubs of the UK, the university clubs, in an area called the Picos de Europa, um, which is in northern Spain. We saw some photos of it earlier. Now, <coughs> this uh, photo might look a bit bizarre, skinny little Englishman with a large twin set of 12s on his back. And if those of you with sharp eyes will notice they are not manifolded. And the reason for this is that basically the size of cave we needed to get these cylinders into to make the dive was such that we couldn't carry a twin set into the cave. And normally cave divers use side mount equipment. And this particular dive, because of the amount of camera equipment Gavin wanted to take, because we were making a documentary for BBC for a TV show they did um, back in, I think, 2000, it was screened called um, Extreme Lives. Each episode of the show was about an extreme sport and why people do it, really the psychology of why do people skydive, why do people big wave surf. And one episode was on cave diving. And they approached Gavin about a suitable project and invited us to make a movie of the uh, Picos de Europa. One thing they liked about it is the dive site we were aiming for is actually at the bottom of this gorge. And the only way to get the gear to it is to basically descend on foot all the way down the mountain. And we decided that to make life easier, rather than having to carry the cylinders back up the mountain to refill them, we'd carry the compressor to the bottom of the mountain so we could make a base camp um, on the ledge outside of the cave entrance. We split the compressor in half into the compressor and the driving motor, put it on two rucksacks, carried it down there and made a base camp outside the cave. It was a great idea till we had to carry it back up, but it did work. So the black hole to the left of the picture, down the bottom of that is the uh, entrance to the cave. Um, many years ago, uh, the entrance to the cave was walled. As you can see, the team here are sat on that wall. Behind them, the black space is the entrance to the cave, a lake created by the wall. And the reason for the wall is it leads to a canal that brought the water all the way from the cave at the bottom of that gorge, many kilometers along the gorge to then go down into town as a water source. And then in later times, that dropping water was also used for hydroelectric and still is to this day. So <clears throat> we were able to get into this cave from the lake behind this wall, short swim across the lake, equipment across on a rope Tyrolean, and then you've got dry cave for about six, six or seven kilometers of dry cave, some of which very small. And at one point, you get to a junction. And the right hand route of the junction is a smooth, sandy floored, two meter high, two meter wide, round tunnel going off for a long distance, easy going, walk along it with a cylinder or a rucksack on your back. The left hand point at this junction is a very low, sharp rock, half full of water, flat on your face, crawl, pulling a 12 litre cylinder, then another one, then a box of regulators, then a video camera, etc. So if any of you have watched Monty Python, the Holy Grail, there's a scene where the knights come out of the forest and there's a sign to a happy life, voluptuous virgins and, and uh, all good things to the right and the road to certain death to the left. So the, um, the cave site that we were aiming to dive was called The Road to Certain Death. And that was the name they gave to the TV show because it had a nice ring to it and a bit of Pythonesque. Um, 
If you see on the uh, left-hand side there, first person is Gavin Newman, the cameraman. Um, the skinny little person next to him is a very young me. This is my first really big, big boys expedition, a six-week project to go out and dive the site. <clears throat> and then the rest of the team, including uh, the beard there in the middle, Leo Dickinson, the adventure cameraman who filmed ballooning over Everest and other such things. So we were able to go down here and explore, which again was another fantastic thing. Um, the first sump is just behind the wall that we saw. You, know, you don't actually need to dive it, but I've included this photo to give you an idea of the dimensions of some of the underwater passages and why we use side mount, not back mount. Like I said, those uh, back mount cylinders were for the big deep site that we decided to dive on this project. So here you've got the rock wall on your left and right, the floor just below you and the roof above, and no more space to move. Now this is a beautifully clear site. The water, because it's flowing all the time, over clean wash limestone is traveled through several kilometers of limestone underground. So it's been filtered, purified. The floor is shingle and gravel, not mud. So it stays clear like this, not only on the way in, <coughs> excuse me, but also on the way out. Beautiful, rare cave diving. Doesn't happen a lot in the UK, but it does sometimes, as you'll see shortly. But just to give you an idea of the size of the environment. This is one of my early configurations. It's an old troll harness. The cylinders are on hard metal bands with belt loops on my side, so they can't be removed easily unless you take the whole thing off. I'm on Poseidon jet streams, which was my uh, regulator of choice back at the time. An old custom diver's light with a lead acid battery, which I thought was the brightest thing ever back then. But technology marches on um, and my, uh, my old beaver wetsuit, but perfectly good for the job. Now, this is the main entrance. The three people you can see there are standing on that wall that we described. And um, the reason I include this photo is firstly for scale. So the main entrance to the cave is behind those people, a short swim across the lake, climb up into the roof, dry cave tunnel for several kilometers. And then you come to a dead flat wall and it's a dead end at the end of the road to certain depth. And you think, well, why are we here? What, what's to explore? But by taking a battery operated electric drill and drill into that wall, put screws in, connect a ladder onto the screw, climb up, put another one, climb up, put another one, eventually you get to the top of that wall. Because from the floor level, about 30 meters down, you can see a crack at the top of this wall. When you get to the top of that wall, it's not a crack, it's a shelf. And the other side of the shelf is what's called a perched sump. So a lake, a crystal clear, deep, cold lake. And this is a flood overflow, so it doesn't normally flow. The main river is now another place in the cave, down the nice passage. The reason we were diving this is because there's no flow, the idea was this flood overflow might be a way to get to further reaches of the main river system um, without diving the high flow, difficult to access main river. And this had been dived um, by an incredibly famous UK British cave diver, um, Rob Parker. And he got to what he thought was the elbow because he'd got to gravel on the floor, a scoop in the passage, and he'd looked up. And bear in mind back then, with a couple of very small um, lead acid battery headlights, so little glowy brown lights, like a candle in a jam jar. And he'd looked up and seen his bubbles disappearing into the roof up a shaft. So he thought quite likely he'd reach the elbow. Based on that intel, we went to have a look if we could pass that elbow ascend the other side to dry cave and follow the dry cave to reconnect with the main river, the hidden river inside this mountain. When we got to his deep point with brighter lights, with bigger cylinders, with oxygen for deco, with oxygen compatible deco computers so we could shorten our deco, we realized that what he'd seen above was just a blind chimney and there was a, another crack off to the front of the passage and around it, it's almost invisible, like an illusion. Around it, the passage dropped again. Now, um, I'm, I'm very sensible now. I'm also a lot older, so I like a lot of helium in my mix. I like a nice shallow END, a nice low density breathing medium, all the things we've learned from the physiology and decompression, etc. Back in 1998, I was kind of eight years into my career. I was young, enthusiastic, a little bit more rote, 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 uh, and robust than maybe I am now. And we ended up laying line in that new extended passage to um, just over 70 meters. Now the water temperature is six degrees C. 
The dive site is at the top of a 30 meter wall. You climb on a uh, metal rung ladder that you put in. Um, this is about six kilometers from this entrance. This entrance is a good day's walk down that gorge you saw. And I'm laying line at 70 meters, about 600 meters of distance into this sump um, on air because it's what we had, because we'd been told this 50 meter point was the elbow and it got shallower. So Gavin is filming this for the BBC. And when we surface, the first thing Gavin says is, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not even sure if I filmed that. I think I might have been so knocked I was pointing the camera at myself rather than at you. So he desperately wanted to see the film. We rushed up back up to the base camp at the top of the gorge and it worked out, it came off. And the, the film's still out there. It's, a, it's on YouTube in three parts as the road to certain death. But another reason for this photo is just those of you that wreck dive or boat dive or go out to sea and know that we lose a lot of our dives because of the weather. The wind blows, the sea gets rough, the skipper calls and says, sorry guys, the dive's been canceled. Well, cave divers aren't immune. This photo um, the legacy with the grass um, just to the left of the people on the rock. So if the point is working for you guys just here, on our expedition, we basically had a, a lean-to shelter there made of a tarpaulin, the compressor, stoves, ability to make food. If you really needed to, you could sleep there for the night if you're too tired to walk up the gorge. But about three hours later, it looked like this. So that is how fast the hydrogeology of a cave can change. Now, fortunately, virtually all of the cave that you travel through to get to the dive site is above the flood zone. So this looks very, very dangerous from this to this. But if you're inside the cave when this happens, you can sit it out. You can get up to a high level area. There's sleeping bags, food, stoves, emergency equipment to do this. And the journey time of the water going into this cave system further up the valley at a cave called uh, Marniosa and coming to here is very short in geological terms, in cave terms. So if this happens, it then dies down and drops very, very quickly. But how do you avoid this? The same way that you guys avoid being out at sea in terrible rough conditions that become dangerous, weather forecast. You make sure you're not going into these cave systems when high rain is forecast to avoid flash flood scenarios like this. So from Spain, I was then uh, very privileged to be invited to do some exploratory dives in Russia. My first two trips were in the Caucasus Mountains above the town of Sochi um, to a cave called uh, Podmanzea Hosta and another cave called Glabuki Yar, both of which were deep water exploration caves. But then the next projects I was invited on were up in the Ural Mountains and we did uh, some winter and some summer trips. There's pros and cons. The problem with a summer trip is the visibility is generally poor, the flow can be very, very high, and the insects are unbearable, like just thousands of black fly, sand fly, mosquitoes, etc. And it's the tiger forest, the boreal forest around the top of the world. But every site you come to, most of which have been found in the winter, because the exiting water from the mountain is warmer, so it can basically um, melt the snow and give you a black spot and the hunters know about this so they tell the local um, people they tell the cave diving community and you can go and check these things out but this site for example it's just a small pool of water that's flowing out and joining the main white river in it load of fallen trees because nobody's been there why would they this is about four days by uh, raft and and canoe um, basically down the white river and then you dive it and you basically put together now a one that's slightly more modern side mount system, cylinders removable. And at the bottom of this pool of collapsed trees is a small entrance you can see in the upper picture. And here we were able to lay a kilometre of line. Nobody ever dived in this site before. And um, that eventually surfaced in dry cave. And um, the dry cave was very short, led to a waterfall falling from the ceiling. And we didn't on that project have the equipment to climb that waterfall, but we just basically past a kilometre long sump that nobody had ever dived before. And the Urals are riddled with this type of stuff. It's absolutely everywhere. Um, Globuki Yar, the other one that we, we did in the Caucasus that we we're talking about, is was a really tough trip, but very, very rewarding. It had already been dived. Um, you can see there there's a variety of different flooded sections. We call them sumps. Sump one um, needs to be dived. But then you see at 34 metres over here, 
the line doesn't join. And that's because you can dive this to here and look through a slot like a letterbox. You can dive it from here on the inside and look through the same slot like a letterbox. So if there's two divers, one other side, you can see each other's light, but you can't get through. It's smaller than a human being, even inside now. So you have to dive it, come up through this poor vis boulder collapse, then climb up here with the equipment, then rappel down here with the equipment, dive this second flooded section, and then walk over a boulder pile in this huge dry chamber and dive this flooded section, then crawl over boulders in this low dry section to this canal. And then the last sump four um, was basically been dived to about 50 meters previously by Russian divers, and we were invited to take it further with Trimix. So it took us about a month to eventually get enough gear here for a push dive. I had a mix with me um, capable of 90 meters, open circuit, three decompression gases, two support divers. <clears throat> and I left the support divers sat here, two Russian guys. They spoke a little bit of English, became very good friends of mine. And I went off for my exploratory dive, got down to this point at 76 meters and the ceiling and the gravel floor basically um, were basically then uh, met. The water flow was coming out of the um, gravel. There was no way physically to get through, no way to look on. So it was effectively blocked. And what that normally happens when there's an elbow and basically the water is able to flow through the gravel blocking the elbow. This will become important later in the talk. Is enough to get the water through, but it can't let a person go through and that gravel would have to be removed to get through. But here we're at 76 meters, very remote place in the fourth flooded section of a long cave. So I did the sensible thing and turned and came back, started my decompression. And when I came up and surfaced, I couldn't believe it. The whole air chamber was just like fog. And as I took my regulator out, it could smell around the edge of my mask. It smelled like burning. And I was like, what's that? And I basically noticed my two Russian support divers were sat here eating um, very spicy local sausage, drinking vodka and smoking a cigarette because they basically put the sausage, the cigarettes and the um, uh, little hip flask of vodka down the sides of the square lead acid battery in their canister light. Uh, and basically um, from there, they would basically been able to take the lid off the canister light and have some R&R &R while they were waiting for me to come back, which is kind of typically Russian. Uh, but they were really hard working. They helped me carry all the gear out. Interesting one with this one is the entrance has got like a big waterfall off the mountain on the outside. And you go behind that waterfall to get into the cave. And then inside the cave is another waterfall falling kind of parallel, like a double rainbow, but inside the cave. And we had to rig a wire haul line up to the top of that waterfall to drag all the equipment into the cave. So a lot of hard work, but to get the reward of exploration. Seem to have lost the ability to change. Right, I'm just going to stop sharing because we seem to have lost the ability to change screen, which did happen once before. So bear with me two seconds. Right, let's try that again. There we go. So um, this is another one of the sites along the White River. This is what's called Sakaska, and this has got huge potential. A lot of people say, why haven't you been back? Well, the main reason we've not been able to go back is it, the difficulty and the team size to get to a place like this. This cliff is about 70 meters high. This is now a huge lake created by the building of a modern dam built within the last 10 years. The original entrance was here, small lake, in good diveable conditions, in flood conditions, non-diveable brown water like chocolate milk, good diveable conditions, crystal clear. But this entrance on this photo is about 30 meters under the surface of the lake. Now this has made getting to it easier. You can now go to the dam by Land Rover, load up the boats with a small outboard, travel up the, up the river, up the lake um, to a camp area and then dive the site. And when we first went here, it was a winter trip, so we went on snowmobiles. Um, and the second time we came in summer, but from the top down. Um, what happens is at 30 meters depth, you go into the main tunnel. Um, if you go to the top of this cliff and walk overland over the mountain top, it's a really nice walk. But after seven kilometers, 
there's a huge hole in the rock and you can rappel down that just under 100 meters vertical and at the bottom of it is a fast flowing river going past you underneath that river by dye testing comes out here from that hole another seven kilometers over the mountain is a dry cave if that is followed to the end there is a river in it dye testing mm -hmm. brings that water through to Sungun and then through to Sakaska. So basically, it's a 14 kilometer as the crow flies direct line. Somebody's uh, not muted. Um, 14 kilometers straight line with the hydrogeology proven by fluorescein for this master system. And that's always the journey you're trying to achieve as a cave diver to join up these master systems. Again, camp life in Russia is pretty basic. You can swim and have a wash in the lake, but even better, throughout the day, they can heat up the rocks with a fire within this rock pile. You notice the frame of wood. You put the tent over the top of it once the fire's gone out, and you've then got a homemade sauna in the wild. The scenery is beautiful, but you do have to worry a little bit about the insects. The insects are insane. So home ground. A UK project to get my teeth into, a bit like a UK wreck. Um, I thought that it would be nice to start working on a site that was connected to probably the most famous cave diving site where cave diving was born. In 1946, the first cave dives were made with C.B. Gorman brass helmet in Wookiee Hole in Somerset. But where that water comes from is up on top of the mountain in a small village called Pretty, mainly from Free Caves, Eastwater Cavern, St. Cuthbert's Swallet and Swilden's Hole. And the 12th flooded section of Wilden's Hole had, had already eluded passing. It was blocked at the bottom. There was no way on. So myself, Andy Stewart and Greg Brock started working on digging in this site. And yeah, I did say digging. We would go to this site, which is basically 11 dives to get to this point. And the conditions um, are out like this all the time, uh, chocolate milk. And you would go down to the bottom with a 25 gallon plastic soft lime drum with the top cut off and a frying pan and scoop the mud and gravel with the frying pan into the soft lime drum till it was full. Pull on a line as a signal. The team would pull it up. They'd tip it in one of those big um, thousand kilo sandbags you get from Juicen, sprinkle cement dust on it so it would set so it couldn't wash back into this sump again and send the box down to you and you'd repeat. We did this for two years, every second weekend, um, averaging 10, 11 hours in the cave for three people to dig for about 20 minutes with a seven litre cylinder and slowly extend this passage. And it's backbreaking work, um, but basically the, the dream of British cave diving, probably one of the biggest dreams of British cave diving, would be one day to connect one of the small caves on top of Mendip such as Swildens, to Wookiee Hole, straight through the mountain, follow the river's journey. So we stuck up that. You can see here, um, we basically got this little field by this um, forest here. There's a small cave entrance here. This is a little hut and you can go into it to Swildens. Up here on top of the hill is the church. This is roughly um, about where the first flooded section is, some one. So cave entrance here, first flooded section here runs across, <clears throat> takes a dog leg, comes over here. And this is the Queen Victoria pub. In the field behind the pub garden, um, there is now a copper pipe nailed into the field to mark the spot. With radio location, we proved that some 12, the 12th diving section is here. So the journey from here to here to here is a nice Sunday walk of about half an hour um, or a fairly squalid two to three hour journey, depending on how much equipment you're carrying to do so underground to get to the terminal point. A couple of miles later, you get to Wookie Hole, or the water does. And again, dye testing has proven that water reaches. But to give you an idea of the conditions you're in, the top left is um, the bypass to Sump 7. The seventh flooded section can be avoided by a bypass, which means crawling with just enough room for your head and your nose. And it does get worse than this, but we wanted a photo we could use. Um, with obviously both shoulders pinned to the rock, your belly on the floor in gravel and mud, and your head on the ceiling, and you're pushing through there, dragging cylinders behind you. Um, this is a piece of the dry cave. This is the connection between sump 12 and sump 12A, um, but it's there for scale 
So when we're diving in Sump 12, you're in a space about this big. So we couldn't take a photo in Sump 12, taken this one as a reference for you. And lots of these, what are called ducks, where you have to basically get right down to get underneath a small space to carry on. Um, other areas a little bit bigger. This is just before Sump 12. Um, so it's, it's basically pretty muddy cave. Um, there's a lot of cow farms on Mendip. So there's a lot of cow effluent that works its way down through the fields. There's lots of worms and bits and pieces in the water. Um, but the dream is to connect it. You might think I'm stark craving mad, but the exploration dream to be the first to do so is what drives it. Now, this photo is not Swildens, but I wanted to show you a photo that gives you the dimensions. Digging Sump 12 is very similar to this. This is a squeeze entrance to one of the longest cave dives, certainly in the southern regions of the UK, in southern Wales, a cave site called Puffy Cum, which is the resurgence or spring um, back door to a huge cave system called Darren Keeley. And this is a, a squeeze to get in. Shoulder blades against the roof, belly on the floor on the gravel, each arm pinned against the walls. So it's just big enough for one person with a side mount cylinder under each arm. Um, this was taken with a huge fisheye lens. Gavin Newman took this shot again. The lens is almost touching me. It's that close. The orange in the water is the tannins of the vegetation in the water. You get this orangey, ambery glow. But this gives you an idea of what it's like digging in some 12 Swildens. Now, over, over the years, what we managed to do was clear the obstruction at the bottom of sump and basically break through. Uh, we got through the elbow point into New Passage, came up and found that what actually we'd done was connected sump 12 to 12A. From there, we carried on digging and extended its depth down to just sharp 60 metres, um, about 60 metres in from sump 12, and hit another elbow of gravel choke. And there we were scuppered because we weren't physically able to get the um, soft and lime drums of gravel and mud back to dry land to empty them because we couldn't take a big enough team couldn't find a big enough team of volunteers so the the open end is waiting for any youngsters keen enough and fit enough to go and have another go at the end of swildens why did we try and do it because it goes here not all british cave diving is zero visibility and horrible this is wookie hole absolutely beautiful um, cave diving. Scalloped roof, a rippled sand floor, 10 meters visibility. Um, and this was basically <clears throat> um, this year, we got some premium conditions just after the, the lockdown ended and got to do some dives in there, got to do some uh, work in there on some of the um, connection points, um, some of the jobs that are going on there to connect pieces of dry cave to flooded cave. And uh, these shots were just GoPro screen grab grabs uh, taken by uh, my, god my godson, Robert Thomas, and uh, my very good friend and cave diving buddy, his dad, Mike Thomas. And we were able to do some really good dives um, and some, uh, get some great shots and have a bit of fun. This is why we do the horrible stuff on the previous slides, because it, ideally, one day, the likes of us digging in zero viz at the end of Swildens will connect up with the likes of Rick Stanton and John Valanthem, who've explored the 25th terminal point of Wookie Hole to over 90 meters of depth on homemade rebreathers. Cave divers are inventive to say the least. And with those two endpoints, Swildens 12, Wookie 25, the gap in between is shrinking, as they say. And eventually, with technologies growing, one day someone will get through. One of the main cave regions that's accessible. So if any of you are cave divers or thinking of taking up cave diving, the Lot region in France is an incredible place to go. This cave, this cave is very, very special to me, which is why I included this photo. It's a place called the Land Anous. Um, it was shut for almost two years. And I, I happened to be there and was invited by the main dive shop owner there who had the permission the day it opened off those two years shut. So we got to go and do a dive in it on that day, which is this shot. It's absolutely stunning. White gravel floor, beautiful scalloped walls, um, and an absolutely beautiful place to, to dive. But again, now back to a very different technology, big cave, rebreather, multiple bait out cylinders, DPVs. This photo's taken um, about 900 meters into the emergence de Russell from 300 meters, the cave is 
consistently at 50 plus meters of depth, um, reaches a maximum of 80 meters of depth, or just shy about 78 meters of depth as it elbows, and then climbs up the other side to surface um, in some huge cave, and then goes on to another six flooded sections and over six kilometers of length, end of which again explored by Rick Stanton and his team over the years. Um, this was a project done with uh, the Divers of the Dark, um, Yanni and Antti and Sami um, from, from um, Finland. So the aim was to get through the big flooded section, which uh, sump one and sump two together is 2.2 kilometers of length, average depth of 50 meters, maximum depth of 80. So using multiple stages, scooters and backup scooters, we were able to get through to here. This is the end of sump two. You don't need to go to dry land between sumps one and two. You can just dive straight past the air surface, which is minimal. And you get to this, a big pile of rocks, but with a tantalizing black hole up ahead of you here. And what's in that tantalizing black hole when you climb out is this. You can see the people for scale. This is a huge chamber. It's called Bivouac Hall because a lot of the explorers that have gone on from here to dive sumps three, four, five, and six um, have slept here and based themselves here for the duration of their explorations. But um, in high flood, this chamber would contain the river. In, in low water conditions, the river goes through these boulders underneath you surface where the cameraman is, and over the other side of this pile of boulders, just beyond the people, is the start of some free. So for me, people say, well, isn't it just wet rock? I say, well, you know, Cheddar Gorge, the Grand Canyon, why do people go there? Because they're awe inspired by what nature can create. This is the same, it's just underground. You don't rarely see it like this, because this was Divers of the Dark with their huge video lights, normally, you just about see the roof with your regular cave lights, but it's beautiful. Now, caves aren't always in the most expected of places. Um, with National Geographic and Jill Heinrich, myself and uh, uh, one of my mentors of my career, Kevin Gurr, were invited um, to go cave diving in the Sahara, which sounds a bit ridiculous. But in the 60s, the Russians went out um, about a thousand kilometers south of the North African coastline at Mersa Matru, um, down the desert highway, which goes around to the, uh, the west of um, the Alamein minefield area from the, from the Second World War, and comes to a, a town, a very small town called Siwa. And the Siwa is in a depression. Now, the Siwa depression um, is basically the edge uh, of the, the, the Sahara proper. And they went there to drill for oil and they hit water. So there's these huge shallow lakes that evaporate dramatically, leaving salt pans. But the water just pours up from deep boreholes in the ground. There is geologically an aquifer, a freshwater source under the desert there. But basically, like a lot of this stuff, if you imagine a desert floor like this and the line of the, um, the aquifer or the limestone portion like this, where we were, at the top of that um, aquifer area, the water is really deep, like six, seven hundred meters below the desert. Way, way further down into the desert, it possibly comes up shallower. But you have to go and look. <coughs> you can't just say, oh, there'd be nothing there. Cave exploration is about going and looking. And it was a fabulous trip. Lots of off-road miles in the desert. Every time we found a pool of water, we'd go dive it. I remember sitting in one of these pools that basically comes out the ground hot enough to make tea. So you get into the pool further away where it's cooled down enough to be a really, really hot bath, like a spa, looking up at the stars over the Sahara one evening. It's just quite magical. There's no light pollution, real dark air, dark sky area. And this is sunrise one morning on the way to one of the dive sites. This lake averages about four to five centimeters deep. So it's just spread out over a huge amount of area. As the sun comes up in the Sahara, it evaporates away, leaving just masses of salt plain that you can drive over. And then it basically fills up again overnight. So it's just a, a truly magical area. And then we came on to really my biggest project, um, what it had all been building towards, learning to climb, learning to use ropes, to rappel down them, to use equipment to climb up them, to cave dive, to use rebreathers, to use all sorts of technologies. Um, J2 was the project where it all really came together. I got to use all those disciplines at once. I always joke with people, I went to J2 in 2013. Um, 
I was about 45, I think, back then. And um, I really needed to be about 10 years younger because it was so physically hard. I went out really physically fit. I trained for a year ready for the project. I went out at 75 kilos. I came home three months later at 65 kilos, very gaunt with sunken cheeks. I'd spent three months in the jungle, um, such as the photo here, insects, bugs, um, slime, dirt, rain, not a very pleasant place for a base camp. And off that three months, I'd spent 45 days underground in the cave, the longest single trip being 21 days, a three week stint um, to explore. But using these multiple technologies, we entered this grotty little hole in the jungle up on the mountain and were able to um, explore the end of the cave. So here we basically give you an idea. This is the J2 main entrance. This is the last bash side entrance. We use the last bash entrance because it avoids the first flooded section. And with cave diving, what you're really trying to do is not have to cave dive. For a cave explorer, a cave dive is a means to get to more of the cave. Here's the J2 entrance in cross section, the last bash entrance. So we repel down here. It's about half a kilometer of rope, almost direct. Then it continues in smaller steps to the first underground camp, Camp 2A. Carries on down to Camp 3, carries on down to the first flooded section we have to dive, Sump 2. There's then another kilometre of dry cave with a camp, Camp 4. And then we got the unpassed sump, which had been dived on a previous expedition to about 300 metres of distance. Um, we were able to continue, tie on a line, swim off into the unknown. Beyond Sum 2 was just two of us, Marcin Gala from Poland and myself. Up to that point was a 55-man team from 15 different countries. You can't do projects like this on your own. It's all about the teamwork. Starts with a lot of rope and what goes down must come up. We had to descend all of this rope with the cylinders, bits of rebreather, um, regulators, bailouts, softener line, everything we needed, sleeping bag, foods, stoves, gas, everything all the way down these ropes and at the end of the project carried back out. Then inevitably caves aren't just nice clean tunnels like railway tunnels, big sections involve crawling, flat on your face in shallow water, dragging the cylinders, the rebreather components all packed up in protective boxes along behind you or hauling it. So a lot of hard work. The journey is very, very varied. A lot of the time you're on rope, either traversing across drops or traversing across the top of the waterfall to avoid the flow and then rappelling down and um, traversing over the top of deep pools of water and traveling your way down through the mountain. Um, Sump 2 is just over one kilometer vertically from the entrance. So you've descended a kilometer down into the mountain. It's just over 10 kilometers from the entrance horizontally. So it's a long way from home. Um, to get there, you're sleeping underground multiple nights um, Camp 2A is in a big chamber, um, about a day's journey from the entrance. The reason for the tent doesn't rain in a cave. It does drip, but it's more for the wind. Caves have a flow of air where atmospheric pressure changes. The cave tries to equalize. So caves will either be breathing in or breathing out. So it's quite drafty. So we sleep in this tent to stop the draft and also for the combined body heat of basically 10 people can sleep in this big tent all the rest of the gear, the cooking area, et cetera, here. From here, another day's travel brings you to this, which is Camp 3. And from Camp 3, um, a morning's travel takes you to the dive base for the first diving section. The um, team was very well set up. We basically, if you can just see this wire, um, we're 12 kilometers at Camp 4, we're 12 kilometers from the entrance. We'd run 12 kilometers of cable um, actually a little bit more from base camp to the entrance and then all the way down through the first flooded section. So we we're able to talk to each camp and to base camp by radio. Um, these radios were carried with you. They could just clip into the, to the wire anywhere you wished. And it meant that at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. every day, we could have a team meeting with our expedition leader, Bill Stone, up on the mountain um, with the other camps and ask for supplies. We need more food at camp two. We need more soft lime at dive base. We need more gas canisters at, ready to go through the sump to sump four. So huge logistics mountain of things to do to get us in the water. Parts of the cave are stunningly beautiful, really varied geology, big chambers, 
once you get down into the heart of the mountain, once you've gone down all those ropes and been through all those crawls, you're into big borehole. And this is what we want. We want borehole like this, and we want vertical drops. We want to go down, down, down into the mountain. Chevra, J2, Palamora, um, and Huatla on the opposite mountain are all in the same region. And they all resurge down into the same valley. And the amount of cast limestone there that has yet to be explored is immense. Bill Stone spent 40 years of his life exploring this region um, from Huatla. Chris Jewell and his team, um, lead diver Jason Mallinson, uh, got the deepest cave in the Western Hemisphere um, in Huatla by extending the terminal sump um, to over 80 meters of depth, um, same time as we were here. So the, the region is just prime cave exploration territory. Beautiful formations, these huge flowstone formations hanging down from the wall where basically minerals left in the rock when the limestone has dissolved flow and drip and create these formations almost like coral. So it's not just wet rock. There's some stunning things here. And eventually after 10 kilometers of caving, a kilometer of it vertical on rope, you arrive here. This is Sump 2. Um, Sump 2 is 200 meters long, um, about 12 meters average depth. We've got an 11 mil climbing rope rigged through it because what you do then is you go back and forward through that sump with 20 kilo bags full of everything needed to explore beyond and set two people up with an advanced base camp, camp for beyond this sump. But uh, it's a long way to go to your dive. Anyone ever says it's hard to walk from the middle car park at Stony Cove to the water on a weekend um, should try going to sump two in J2 for a dive. It uh, really puts it in perspective. Conditions in a dive are excellent. Um, we were using cislunar rebreathers. Like I say, the electronics uh, evolved from the cislunar rebreather. Um, uh, Poseidon took that on board. This was a modified Mark VI um, and with carbon fiber cylinders, meaning we could use 400 bar. Um, we didn't need rebreathers for this depth and length of cave dive. The cave, uh, first cave dive is 200 meters long. Uh, the second one, some four, which we were able to pass during the 2013 expedition after 600 meters of line laid, which in this remote area is quite a long sum, could have been done on open circuit, but you'd have only got one dive. Then you'd have had to carry the cylinders all the way back out to fill them again. So it was elected to use rebreather because all we needed then was soft line. With the 400 bar cylinders on the rebreather and in the bailouts, um, we could have enough gas to last the planned dives for the three month project. And that system worked very, very well. When we surfaced, we came up in this tiny little room about the size of the back of a small van. So there's me looking at Marcin. Marcin's got a head mounted camera. This is a still grab from his GoPro. And we sit in this room going like, well, was this it? We've just laid 600 meters of line. We've just spent a 19 day trip, a five day trip, and now we're into a 21 day trip underground to achieve this. And there's no way on. We're in this tiny little room, like the size of the back of a van. And I pulled my hood away from my ear to be able to talk to him. And I couldn't hear anything because of the roar of water. And then we were ecstatic. What we're looking for is not more dives. We're looking for a waterfall. And the reason we're looking for a waterfall is what we want to achieve is we want J2 to go deeper deeper, deeper, because that will take it closer to the bottom of the valley where this water comes out in the resurgence or the spring and the entrance to exit connection will eventually have been made. So we de-kitted, managed to find a way for a small hole and found this big waterfall. Um, that was the end of the 19 day trip. Um, towards the end of the third month, we managed to go back in for 21 days and get back to that waterfall with climbing equipment and descend it and carried on down in the new river until we got to a point where all the boulders from an earthquake tens of thousands of years ago had basically locked together and then glued together with the calcite dripping over tens of thousands of years. And this river was going through finger-sized slots amongst the boulders and could be heard flowing off into the distance beyond it. So in this remote place, no way through those boulders. And this is exactly what happened to um, Rick Stanton and Jason Mallinson in Chevra, they got past uh, some four there and found the same thing. There's a fault line, a geological fault line across the mountain, and these boulder collapses are in that fault line. And basically, this is an obstacle that will need to be overcome in later years. COVID permitting, the team are back out 
uh, to Chevra to look at bypasses to climb over it next year, a four month project in, from January onwards. So the exploration always continues. And that's me with a shraggly old beard, sunken cheeks and visible collarbones, 65 kilos, 10 lost after three months in the jungle. Marcin, top um, right, my buddy for that whole project. I spent uh, the 19 and the 21 day trip underground with him, nine days of which beyond some two, just me and him alone in the mountain, which was uh, a real honor. And he became more than a friend, a brother out of that experience. And one of the absolutely true greats, pioneers, and, and you know, inspirational lights of the caving and cave diving community, Bill Stone on the, uh, on the left there, the project leader uh, and expedition leader. Now, just to finish off with um, a slight difference. Um, I don't only do caves, I, I do do uh, wrecks as well and bits and pieces like that. They're not my passion, so to speak, but I, I appreciate them. But what I really love is diving in mines. And I've not done too much at the end of this talk on mines because I got the invitation very kindly from you guys to speak to you this evening because of a little 10 minute section I did in Lisa's talk earlier in the year on Newfoundland about the flooded mine there. And mines can be brilliant because basically, if you imagine all the industrial archaeology of things as complex and amazing as a steam engine on a ship in a cave, that's mine diving. You've got all these steam engines, wagons, elevators, tram lines, points, weighing machines, wagons, everything in a cave like environment. So they can be absolutely mind blowing. Um, despite the fact that Sammy has written all over all this equipment, um, that is because um, Sammy is a, a very, very good friend of mine. Um, he's a, a classic example of what's happened a lot in my career, a student who became um, a friend and then beyond a friend is another who's like a, like a brother with me, to be honest. I qu quite regularly go out to Finland and turn up with nothing but my dry suit. Um, in this case, my Loitakari. Uh, rubber dry suit, which makes you look like a bit of a gimp, but it's got a dry hood, dry gloves, no neck seal, no wrist seal, heavy duty rubber. It's the warmest suit I've ever used. And the reason for that is this shot's taken half a kilometer into the Oyamo mine at 50 meters of depth all the way from the entrance um, at a place called Hell's Gate. Um, so um, basically, I've gone out with just my dry suit, my mask and my fins, and Sammy has lent me his spare JJ his cylinders, his regulators, his spare scooter, and we've gone off to take some photos. And this is Sammy's work. He's just phenomenal at getting really cool photos in really inhospitable places. Sometimes we look forward to a thermocline because you can come through it and have warm water for decompression. This place gives you a real kick in the ribs. The water temperature in the mine where this photo is taken is a constant four degrees. In winter, when we mostly dive the site, the water temperature in the lake where you decompress is between half and one degree. So you've got a reverse thermocline. You come into colder water for deco. And on the dive to Hell's Gate, people often see the photo of Hell's Gate um, in a lot of magazine articles and adverts and things. I mean, oh, I want to go there, thinking the gate is the entrance to the mine. It's not. It's half a kilometer in, and it's a deep dive all the way there. Amazingly found swimming by open circuit divers originally. Um, now a little bit easier with scooters and what have you. So truly stunning place to go, as is the rest of the mine um, and the other mines across um, Scandinavia, like Langbans, Tuna Hasberg and Sala in Sweden, like Montala, um, Oyamo in Finland are just absolutely mind blowing. And my last slide for this evening is uh, kind of where the invitation to talk this evening started. This is the steam pump for pumping water out of the enormous iron mine under Bell Island in Newfoundland that I talked about briefly um, during Lisa's talk earlier in the year. Um, so on that note, I'm, uh, I'm going to stop the screen share and hand back over um, for some questions if there, if there are any.